So um, as background, I guess, I went to Korea <laughs> in 2017 and gave a talk at a um, language learning conference, I guess, that focused on foreign language learning, um, except in the context of Korea, right? So a lot of it was like English um, learning and stuff like that. And one of the topics for that year for this conference was um, basically what does it mean to be literate? What does literacy mean? Um, um, and the people who were invited to talk were all um, like digital digital literacies type of people. So, so they looked at basically new literacies and new practices around literacy. So it isn't just like reading and writing text, but it's actually um, the context matters and the types of texts matter for the context and um, um, the practices around sort of reading and writing matter as well. So what do, what do those practice, practices look like and everything? So that's what this talk is basically about. Um, um, because it's a keynote, um, you know, in a keynote, normally you're asked to talk about yourself a little bit. I'll skip a lot of this, but basically um, when I was growing up, um, I played a lot of games. My parents didn't think it was very worthwhile. And you sort of, you sort of internalize that, you know? So when I was growing up, I felt like I was, I was, uh, I guess, wasting my life from, from, my parents and and sort of the the general po uh, popular opinion back then this is we're talking the 80s and 90s now 90s um, and so um, but I basically ignored it and then I ended up getting a job uh, I got an art degree and then I ended up getting a job at OMSI down in Portland and I, I was making science games for them so then suddenly suddenly all of this like this double life I was leave, living basically where where my hobby life of, of being a gamer and playing games and everything sort of converged with my professional life where suddenly um, my experience playing all these games actually helped with my profession, right? So then suddenly it wasn't a waste of time anymore. Um, um, but when I was at OMSI, I started to realize that uh, I was making these games mostly um, as someone who had played a whole bunch of games, but I, I didn't get a degree in like psychology or anything like that or education. So I, I didn't feel like I was making them as effectively as I could have been, um, you know, in order to teach certain subjects. And so I went to UW, um, got a PhD in education, uh, basically to learn how to, uh, how to make games better um, in terms of trying to teach people certain something. But then when I was at UW, it sort of like totally shifted and I, you know, earlier this quarter, I gave my, that presentation on what my dissertation was about, which is world um, teamwork and World Warcraft, and how how you learn to become an expert in World Warcraft. Um, but anyways, that's so that's my background and everything. Um, okay, so while I was at UW, um, I mean, I guess I'm still at at UW. But while I was a graduate student at UW, um, my concentration, or I guess the field I was in, could be called like digital literacies. Um, which is sort of a subset of um, like language learning and literacy, which is which is like one of the departments of um, of the College of Education at UW Seattle. Um, actually, I was technically in educational technology, um, which no longer exists uh, at, at UW Seattle. But, um, but anyways, um, so I I focus a lot on you know what does it mean to li be literate, um, which is why one of our readings earlier in the quarters was by James G, James G, Jim G, um, you know, because he also focused on literacy, literacy practices, and basically, um, you know, doing stuff that a community does is how you sort of determine whether or not you belong to that community, right? And, and that includes like, um, or that means you are then literate in that community and everything. Um, so like traditional, concept of, of literacy is basically learning how to read and write, um, you know, and, and the new the new sort of notion, I mean, newish, it's like 30 years old now or something like that, um, this concept of, of different literacies. Um, um, it's, not, it's not actually what you know, but it's actually what you do. Um, and, and your expression or your behavior or your um, instantiation or embodiment of certain things that you do based off of the knowledge that you have, right? But it isn't just the knowledge. Um, 
And this has a huge long history of how to think about this and everything. There are a bunch of books. Um, and, uh, and I'm gonna skip a lot of this because I already covered this a few weeks ago. So World Warcraft is an example of a new literacy where you can be literate in the game World Warcraft. Um, an example of that is if you look at the screen, <laughs> um, like I know what's going on in the screen. Um, and most of the people who are my audience at that conference uh, have not seen the game before um, and have no idea what the hell's going on. But um, but the short of it is uh, all these buttons down at the bottom are, are abilities that you can click on or, or items that you can click on and they activate. Um, and um, the numbers on those buttons uh, represent either a hotkey that you can press to make that thing happen or or it's a if it's a number on the bottom right, then it's like the number of items that you have in that stack. Um, and then all the stuff are on the left. <laughs> You see my mouse, right? All the stuff on the left. These are all what are called um, um, unit frames, and um, they represent different characters that are in the party that you're in, or the the raid group that you're in. Um, and they they display certain things. So green bar is usually health, um, and then you have blue, which is usually mana, um, and then you have other other sorts of various colors depict certain things and everything. Um, and you can tell like from from uh, certain icons like what's going on there the, all these people are in combat right which is what the what the cross blades mean and stuff like that um then there's all these other things going on here this is a uh, uh here over here on the right is a damage meter um which shows you uh, basically who has the highest threat who's 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 um threatening the monster the, the most um the person with the highest threat uh highest damage bar usually is the person who has the highest threat, uh, which means that that's who the monster is attacking. And that's really important to pay attention to because you, you then know who to heal and stuff like that and who to who to assist when you're when you're doing um, focus fire and stuff. Um, but anyways, this is kind of ridiculous. Like, like to expect somebody to be able to understand all this um, if they have never ever played, like if you took, if you just took somebody, some random person and just threw them in front of the screen and just said, okay, now go, um, they wouldn't really know where to start, right? And um, it's just this, just this, uh, I guess, emblematic of this fact that in order to actually become an expert in something, you have to spend some time with it. Um, it takes some time in order to understand each of these things. The person who, this isn't my screen, so um, this is just a screenshot that I found online, uh, but the person who, whose screenshot this is um, didn't start off this way. The game doesn't start off this way. The game starts off um, much more basic, a lot fewer things that are on the screen. And slowly over time, you keep adding more bars and more meters and everything to, to make your practice more refined um, and, uh, you know, it just takes time to, to learn all this stuff. Um, but it also extends outside of the game, right? So, uh, again, you know, there's strategy guides and stuff like that, um, different meters and all that. Um, another example, uh, so, you know, that's basically, if you want more World of Warcraft stuff, just go back to the um, presentation I did before. Um, another game that I got into uh, more recently is called The Secret World. So this is from like, I don't know, five years ago, six years ago or something like that. Um, and uh, it's another MMO. And what was cool about the Secret World was uh, there were a bunch of things in the game that um, weren't handholdy. Um, if you're familiar with World of Warcraft, when you play the game now, there's like a quest giver. They've got like this, you know, a, a exclamation mark above their head or a question mark above their head. And you, you, so you know who they are, you run over to them, you get your quest. You don't have to read the text at all. You just hit, okay, okay. And then, and then in game, it shows you, it sort of tells you where you're supposed to go and you just kill some monsters and everything and then turn the quest, right? Um, it's very automated and it's very um, 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 like, cut and dry, um, as in they're all, a lot of the quests are very similar to use the same template and everything. So if you've read like the actual quest text is just flavor text and you know, it doesn't actually mean anything um, when, you're, when you're treating the game as a system, you know, you're just trying to blow through the quest as fast as possible so you can level up as fast as possible. The secret world is very different. You actually have to read everything um, because the quests, um, 
the quests are, are, are structured differently, where a lot of times there are these quests where um, there's um, a mystery to uncover and, and it doesn't tell you like where you're supposed to go. Um, you have to sort of like pull up the map and just sort of like, well, this one NPC mentioned like, you know, this hill, um, you know, so maybe they mean that hill, you know, and so let's go there and see if we can find anything. Um, and um, there's one quest in particular that I want to show off real quick. So this is somebody. Um, can you all hear that? No. Very soft. No, I can. Yeah, I can hear yeah. I think what's going on mm -hmm. is what I need to do <laughs> actually is throw my taskbar somewhere else so I can get it. Um, change this to headphones. Um, Can you hear now? It is very soft. Okay, so this is basically, um, this person was just, uh, this is a Let's Play video, right? So this person is running around, playing the game, recording herself as she's playing, and sort of just talking aloud as she's trying to figure out how to solve a particular quest, right? Um, and uh, I'll skip ahead a little bit. Um, there's a section where she gets to this radio tower. So like she's supposed to get to the radio tower, examine it, right? And she thinks she's done everything. Um, So now she's like, okay, how do I listen to that signal, right? So she's running around trying to find it and everything. I'll skip ahead a little bit more. She goes back. Eventually she realizes that she missed something <laughs> and goes back to the radio tower to just activate it again. Okay, do any of you know Morse code? Douglas, you do? You're muted. No, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So so I have had some training on it. Don't, for me to say that I know it, I know. But like out to sea, when we were out to sea, we've had training exercises where we've had to use it where our comms are down or whatnot, you know, and we've had a template and uh, I've got to experiment a little bit, you know, on that. But that's that's about that's about as far. So would you so is she correct? She thinks it's Morse code. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So that's a lot of people sort of thought it was Morse code, but they don't know how to decode it. Right. So when we were out to sea too, we would do it with our lights. So um, that's another way that we did it. So like if we were in distress or whatever, we could, you know, there's a certain pattern of lights or we had certain patterns that we would follow, but it was the same lines as Morse code. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when I did this quest um, and that came on, you know, I, I, I could hear, like I, I was in Boy Scouts and so I had to learn Morse code too, but it goes by too fast for me to be able to do it. And I don't remember it at all, right? So what I did um, uh, was I pulled up the Wikipedia article on Morse code. So then I could see what the letters are because I, don't, I didn't remember. Um, and then I would listen to it and try to match it to here, which I found really, really, really hard to do. Um, 
And most players of this game, I think, sort of went through a similar process. Um, and, uh, you know, so from here, um, you know, here's a, here's a blow up version. Um, <laughs> it's just really hard. So I ended up, what I ended up doing was I recorded it, threw it in Audacity so that it could visualize the waveform of the um, beeps. And from there, you can compare you can compare these to the key. Um, and so that's how I did it. Um, you know, but some some players did it differently and everything. Um, but what struck me sort of as as I was doing this, I was like, this game is awesome because like nothing in the game prepares you for this, and you don't solve it through the game itself unless you already know Morse code. Um, and so you have to rely on all these things that are outside of the game, um, which I thought was really cool. And part of the lore of the secret world, so it's it's supposed to be like this fake, or not fake, but like a, there's a real world of like fairies and giants and like, you know, vampires and stuff like that. That's sort of like underneath the surface of our, of our world. Um, and so there's all this stuff that's sort of like um, the sort of layers of reality um, that's going on in that game. And so the idea that you play the game, but then you also have to sort of step out and refer to like these websites and stuff like that, um, I thought was really cool. And it's totally in, in line with the theme of the game and everything. Um, so one thing, just as an example, there's like uh, characters that you meet in the game. They work for certain companies. They've got like email addresses. If you go, if you browse to that URL, to that domain name, you actually get an, an actual website that exists in our web. Um, you know, and almost everything in this game has like a mirror website that exists on, on our internet, you know, on our, on our web, um, which is really cool. Um, kind of like, um, the movie, uh, um, Cloverfield, you know, there's, there's all these websites related to that movie and that movie series and everything. Also, it, it's really cool to just sort of delve into, um, Cloverfield and the lore of it and all that stuff. So it's similar to this, right? Um. There's all, all sorts of different types of puzzles in this game. There's the cryptograms, um, which again, you know, the game, this is this is all the game gives you, right? So like the way most people would solve this would, would be with paper and pencil um, or some some something else that they have to bring that's more than just the game. So I did it with a text editor, um, you know, and just sort of, it's just a letter replacement, um, pretty pretty easy to do, but but it's really hard to do just in your head. So you have to write it down. Um, there's other stuff like there's a map. Here's a map of a, a location in Egypt, and um, you actually have to import it into like Photoshop or something like that, and draw lines between different landmarks in order to find the the location of certain things in the game and stuff. Um, which just thought was super cool. Um, so a third example of like different types of literacy, or or how that how literacy is more about not just you engaging in the text, but you engaging in a whole bunch of different sort of like um, material practices around the text uh, is D and D, um, and this this is a good like photo that I that I used to show off D and D. Like a lot of D and D online D and D playing is this now. Um, you have your computer, um, and you still have all this sort of like um, physical stuff that you have uh, to refer to and everything. Um, you know, there's people who've done cool things with like their desks and stuff like that or tables and all that. Um, um, you know, projecting a map um, and all that stuff. Okay, so that was my argument to this group of people in South Korea <laughs> that literacy is about the stuff of the thing that you're reading and not just the thing that you're reading and engaging in engaging in sort of like practices around, um, you know, drawing on all these different resources in order to do the thing that you're supposed to be doing. Um, um, and I was trying to make the point that this actually is true for any sort of context, uh, not just games. Um, but let's talk very specifically about what games actually provide and why um, why it may be useful to become literate in games. Um, and this requires a little bit of stepping back. Um, we have a little bit of game definitions um, in this quarter, I think the very first week, right? Because I wanted, I wanted to just give us some foundation. Um, but games to me 
are essentially uh, two things. They are systems. So what that means is um, there's a bunch of different mechanics. They all sort of interrelate with each other. There's a bunch of different objects basically that are interrelated. And when you twiddle one thing, it affects another thing. Um, and figuring out how the different relationships work with each other is part of um, playing at least a video game. Um, this isn't this isn't necessarily true of a board game as much, but a video game for sure is a lot of it is is trying to figure out how the game actually works, um, right? Um, and when you when you sort of like have understand the game enough, then you get bored of it, or you can get bored of it and move on to a different game and everything, right? But a lot of the actual the newness of a game or the, that initial excitement, a lot of it is because you don't know yet how it works. And so you want to try to discover how the system works and everything. Um, there's a lot of good examples of games as systems. There's XCOM, um, there's Division, uh, the Settlers of Catan. Um, you know, you basically have basically like rules that and, and numbers uh, and ways of sort of analyzing and, and, and um, strategizing about sort of maximizing your, your point gain in whatever game it is that you're playing. Um, civilization, <laughs> another case of like, you have no idea what you're looking at unless you've played the game before. Um, EVE Online, which is like spreadsheets in space. Um, and then, okay, so the other thing that games are, are stories. And um, some people don't play the game because they want to discover like this really interesting system to try to uh, puzzle out and everything, right? Some people play games because they're really into, into like these branching narratives and trying to figure out, trying to, I guess, uh, make meaning out of these, uh, these sort of like meaningful stories, I guess, that, that, that um, are portrayed in the games. This is, a, this is a screenshot from Gone Home. Um, and, you know, The Walking Dead is a really good example of this where, where you make uh, meaningful decisions uh, based off these two characters and everything, uh, Banner Saga. Um, a lot of these, these types of games are dialogue driven um, or like they're like uh, character um, driven, you know, where, where, you're, where there's growth in the character um, or growth of something. And so it, it's basically like uh, reading a book or watching a movie. Um, and you know, there's some games that are terrible, just like there are some books and movies that are terrible, right? But there are some that are really, really awesome. Um, and then some of the stories and systems sort of portray um, really interesting subjects uh, where you are, you are sort of placed into certain positions uh, to learn about certain things, right? So this is Cart Life. Um, it's hard to find now, like, um, but it's a free game. Um, um, and it's basically, it's simulating you trying to make money um, operating a food cart in Portland, I think. Um, and uh, you can either be homeless or you can be a, like a single mom or it's just really hard. And then a lot of it's time management and everything. Um, uh, Papers, Please uh, is, is another example of like, there's an interesting system that's sort of like a vehicle for this really interesting story also. Um, but anyways, I'll skip all that, uh, Depression Quest and board games. Okay, so games are systems and stories, right? Um, what does that mean? Um, so there's this guy, Raph Koster, we didn't read him for this quarter, but uh, this book he wrote, uh, Theory of Fun for Video Games or for Game Design is, uh, is really good. And um, the book is written so like, on one page, on the left-hand side is text, and on the right-hand side um, is a cartoon. And so, <laughs> it's a really fast read, and and it's 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 really good. So he's a he's the he was the main sort of designer of Star Wars Galaxies, and um, a bunch of other MMO stuff for uh, Sony. Um, um, but the main thing that he's arguing in this book is that. Um, Understanding systems basically means you are understanding certain patterns or recognizing certain patterns within within a noisy thing, um, and sort of putting things in order, right? Um, and that pattern recognition is what learning is, um, and then it's also what equals fun. 
and this is similar to what Bogos was arguing in his in his persuasive games talk about um, learning how to deal with a wretched system is what makes a game fun. It isn't like throwing points onto something. Um, so understanding systems equals pattern recognition equals learning equals fun. Um, and then likewise with stories, making meaning out of stories um, um, is basically what, what it means is you're able to sort of empathize or sympathize with what's going on in the story and sort of understand the story from like a human perspective, I think. Um, and so you're relating to the events and characters that are in the story and you're making, you're basically connecting these experiences to like your own lived experience. And that's how you're sort of making meaning between, between all these different things. Um, and uh, it's also a form of learning, right? Making connections between different events in your head is, is basically how you, you know, grow, right? And how, how you, how you um, um, grow as a person and, and make, make meaning in your life and everything. So, uh, so understanding systems, the ability to make meaningful choices and um, understanding stories or making meaning from stories is the ability to make meaningful connections. Um, and you could replace these with agency and empathy. So um, agency is basically the, your ability to understand the space that you occupy well enough so that you can make certain choices that, um, that um, sort of exhibit some sort of freedom on your part. Like you, you, you can make um, moves that um, are meaningfully beneficial for you. Right, um, from from a place of understanding of how the system works, uh, and then empathy is basically like you're able to connect with other people. You're able to connect um, these different um, moments to each other and understand, um, you know, how they relate to each other and everything. Right. Um, okay. So meaningful play. Then um, you know. Uh, and a lot of a lot of these other slides are like uh, in the moment I was trying to make it make an argument about uh, what the future would be like and everything because you know um, the future was pretty shitty back then. Um, but all of this is predicated upon this idea that you have that the future can be better. I mean that's why that's why we are doing what we're doing, right? You 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 feel like um, there's a version of yourself and a version of future that is better than who you are now and what the current situation is. And that's what you strive for, you know, in a very basic sense, like if that's, if that's, you know, I want to graduate and I get a job and make money, that future version of you has become, you know, quote unquote, uh, successful because you're now making money and have a job and all this stuff. Right. So that's one version, but, you know, you could think of other things like I, um, you know, have uh, strengthened my relationships with other people or in the future version of myself, right? Or um, um, I know how this system works and so I can improve upon it and work at it. Um, and and that's, that's a future version, um, right? So, so when you're engaging in gameplay or like living life, uh, you have, you believe that there's something better that you can strive forward. Um, um, and then um, for games, it isn't, it isn't just your, you're not just playing for yourself, um, especially in multiplayer games. Like it's like a collective endeavor where you, where you're collectively trying to make, make the world better. Um, and so it's everyone's future that you're, that you're, that you're playing for. Um, so then how does this relate to like games and learning and, and games or social good and all this stuff? It's, for me, uh, a lot of it's like, okay, being able to make these connections and everything is great and everything, but it isn't really enough. We need to be able to instill, I guess, in people a sense of, I guess, duty to each other um, um, and to be good to each other and everything. In my other class in uh, that I teach, um, the last reading of the, of the quarter is this book, The Well-Played Game. Um, and actually I, I have a recording of my presentation for that so I can throw it into our folder later. But um, basically the argument is that the future is not really worth it or the game isn't worth it unless everyone involved is feeling like they are part of it. Um, and so uh, 
you know, I think games, so to answer the question of literacy in games, so literacy is like, you know, all the stuff, right, around whatever it is that you're doing um, and how you use it and how you sort of relate to all, all these sort of different resources and everything. Um, for games, engaging gaming is about working towards some envisioned idealized future and um, through an understanding of, of the situation and through an understanding of the people and events and everything that exists in the situation. Um, so then, um, you know, we want to try to make sure that the idealized version of the future is one that uh, values humanity, um, you know? And so that's basically what this talk was about. Um, yeah, so, you know, we need, we need compassion also, not just empathy. Um, yeah. So I was trying to make an argument to all these people who were not gamers that uh, gaming was worth it um, and that they should all be gaming and everything. So you can read all these slides a little later. Um, all right, that's it. And then I have a couple of questions for our Slack board. Um, which game are you the most literate in? Describe your literacy practices around the game. What social material resources do you use within the whole ecology of playing that game? Um, and Or uh, second question, do you play games for the systems to puzzle out or for the stories to explore? And how does your preference relate to your gamer profile? Remember, we took this gamer profile or we had readings on gamer profile. Um, um, and uh, how strict are these preferences actually? Or does it totally matter? Or, like, does it does it totally depend on like whatever game you're playing or who are you, who you're hanging out with and everything? Um, you know, is there is there a way to like is it is this a false dichotomy even um, system versus the story or puzzle out something versus um, something to sort of narratively explore? Like, is that a false dichotomy? Um, is it more about the blend of of the two? Um, okay, so those are the questions, and oh, I um I was um, hawking this website I was running. I, I run this website called esotericgaming.com, which is about um, arcane gaming practices. Um, so uh, hasn't been there hasn't been an issue for two years now, but um, but I used to run this. Um, okay, and that's it. Any questions? <laughs>